excited to be here with you guys. Oh, I tell you what, sometimes it's hard to be a clean comedian when your name is Dan Bublitz Jr. <laughs> But I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> I saw a pretty girl at a bar one time. She told me I had no game. So I pulled her stool out from under and screamed Jenga. <laughs> How's that for no game? <laughs> you can't have game, though, when you look like I do. Like, I'm well aware of how I look, right? Like, I just look like a walking TED Talk. <laughs> People see me coming and they're like, oh, he's gonna give us a lecture. <laughs> Cause I look like, I look like a dad that never gets mad but is always disappointed in everything you do. <laughs> I just walk around giving disappointing looks to everybody. <laughs> and it's unfortunate, cause I don't actually have kids, uh, but I can do a dad joke, you know? Like, I never grew up, I just grew out. Now I'm looking for a seamstress to take me in. <laughs> I don't care what anybody says, that is a well-tailored joke. <laughs> now that I've sewn that together, we'll move on. <laughs> I'm not cool, I'm not hip, I'm fine with it. But I do get referred to as a hipster a lot. A lot of times people call me a hipster, and I disagree. I don't think I'm a hipster. I think I'm too old to be a hipster. Because the first time somebody called me hipster, I had to Google what a hipster was. <laughs> when I couldn't find it in the encyclopedia. <laughs> My friends say, oh, you wear fancy sweaters, you have a beard, that's what makes you a hipster. I'm like, no, I have a beard because without it, I look like the prime suspect in every kidnapping. <laughs> He sees it. <laughs> Not trying to be cool or hip, just trying to stay out of jail. <laughs> That's all that is. But that definitely, looking like I do, definitely has pros. I'm, you're gonna be surprised by this, but I don't get in a lot of fights. <laughs> you know, a big tough guy like me, you're probably thinking, oh, he probably brawls every day. Nope. Uh, in fact, when I'm out with my friends, if a fight breaks out, I guarantee you nobody's gonna tag me into the fight. You know, they'll think about it, and they might go for it. They'll reach for the tag. Dang! You should go sit back down, Dan. You're going to get hurt. <laughs> and they're absolutely right. I'm fragile. I'll get hurt. <laughs> I'm definitely not a fighter. In fact, in my entire life, I've only been in one physical altercation. And that was with my father when I was 12. He roundhouse kicked me in the face. <laughs> Now, before you judge my father, you should know he was showing me how to do a roundhouse kick and I walked into his foot. <laughs> At least that's what he told me to tell everybody. <laughs> and that's been the story ever since. <laughs> Somebody tried to use my credit card to book a vacation to Europe and it was very upsetting because the bank declined the charges and I didn't get to take a vacation in Europe. <laughs> yeah. The good news is I don't need identity theft protection because I have the next best things. No money and terrible credit. <laughs> in fact, my credit's so bad, somebody tried to steal my identity once when they saw my credit score, they tried to give it back. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, finders keepers, that's yours now. Joke's on you, even I don't want to be me sometimes. My credit history's a little shaky because I had to file bankruptcy uh, a while back. I don't know if anybody's ever had this experience, but it is a real process. And I'm gonna tell you, I never experienced anything like it. Cause you can't just decide that you're broke and quit paying your bills and be like, I'm bankrupt. <laughs> no, there's a process. Uh, that process involves hiring an attorney that attorney gives you a stack of paperwork like this that you have to fill out because you have to qualify for the bankruptcy. You have to qualify to be broke. <laughs> the red in my checking account should qualify me to be broke. I qualified, 
Then the attorney told me it would cost $1,600 to file bankruptcy. <laughs> it's like if I had $1,600 in the bank, I'd probably just pay my bills and wouldn't be in this situation. <laughs> I had to figure out where I was gonna get the money, so I went to a bank, I applied for a loan. <laughs> I qualified for the loan. <laughs> then the banker asked what the loan was for, I said bankruptcy, and security escorted me out of the bank. <laughs> like, touche, touche. Uh, I grew up poor, I come from a poor family. I often think about winning the lottery and what I would do with the money, you know, like, when, uh, when I was in my 20s, I probably would have did just irresponsible things, you know? Spend it on fancy ladies, fancy cars, fancy houses. But at my age, if I won the lottery today, you know what I would do? I would just go to the doctor and actually pay for it. <laughs> Pick that bill up on the way out the door, and the best part is that I can schedule a follow-up appointment without changing healthcare providers. <laughs> Seems like a pretty good thing to me. Like I said, I did come from a poor family. I had a single father. Uh, he was trying to raise two boys on his own. So like as a kid, I didn't quite understand what was happening, but now that I'm an adult, I kind of understand it a little better and kind of get what he was going through. But as a kid, when holidays and birthdays would come around, I didn't get any cool toys. You know, all my friends were getting the latest toys, G.I. Joes, Transformers, things like that. We were getting whitey tidies and holiday-themed sweaters. <laughs> yeah. And my dad thought he was a comedian. One year for my birthday, he gave me a box of rocks. <laughs> I was like, Dad, what am I supposed to do with a box of rocks? He said, son, use your imagination. <laughs> so I did. I imagined I was a superhero, and I used the rocks to rescue the toys from the toy store. <laughs> then when I got home with all the toys, my dad said, son, where did you get all these toys? And I looked him right in the eye and I said, dad, use your imagination. <laughs> then he roundhouse kicked me in the face. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I miss being a kid. Oh man, I don't know if anybody else does, but I really miss being a kid because things are a lot different when you're a kid. You know, like as, you, as an adult, you have to take more responsibility for your actions. You know, like when I was a kid, I could run around naked. It was cute and adorable. Now if I run around naked, I'm definitely just going to jail. <laughs> when I was a kid, I collected comic books. Now people refer to me as a hoarder. <laughs> I don't like how that has changed. Uh, and I really loved holidays as a kid, you know, Halloween, especially Halloween and Easter, two of my favorite holidays. Obviously, because candy's involved in both of them. And I definitely look like I like candy. Uh, yeah, and as a kid, you would wait for the, I would wait for the Easter Bunny to come bring me a basket full of candy. Now, I play the Easter Bunny at a mall. <laughs> That was a big change. <laughs> that was a big change. But let me tell you, uh, playing the Easter Bunny was a great job. It really was. Because kids treat the Easter Bunny like a celebrity. Because when he comes rolling into the mall, they know, they see this magical creature that's gonna hide Easter eggs and candy. They don't see what he really is. Just an overweight, out of work, stand up comic trying to raise money for booze, a drink to forget, how we got into the mall, and a bunny suit. <laughs> Yeah, that's magical. <laughs> like I said, Halloween was another favorite holiday of mine. Uh, as a kid, you know, you get to go trick-or-treating, dress up in costumes. And I think it was funny because my parents always said, don't take candy from strangers. And then one day a year, they dressed me in a disguise to go take candy from strangers. <laughs> It's still my favorite holiday. Halloween is still my favorite holiday, but for different reasons. Now it's my favorite holiday because it's the only time of year when I can go any place at any time and there will be no questions asked if I wear a wig. <laughs> right, like any other time of the year, if I 
show up wearing a wig, there's going to be questions asked. <laughs> because you can't be a bald person that just randomly shows up anytime wearing a wig, you know? People are going to be like, whoa, what happened with Dan? What's going on here with that, you know? And you have to make that decision. As soon as you start balding, you have to make the decision to commit to implants or a toupee or let it go. Yeah. Obviously, I chose to let it go, though I didn't get a lot of time to make the decision because it happened really fast. Yeah, one day I woke up, my receding hairline had just turned into my neckline. <laughs> and I have like a weird balding pattern, so I look like a defective Chia pet. <laughs> Just all forehead now. <laughs> In my 20s, I could actually grow hair on my head. I couldn't grow it on my face. And then it just like did a 180. It was like all the hair on my head just fell out and magically attached itself to my face. <laughs> but I understand what's happening. It's nature maintaining balance. Because what doesn't grow on the top of my head anymore grows everywhere else on my body now. <laughs> Except for one area of my body, hair doesn't grow. It's really weird. From my knees to my ankles, super, super smooth. <laughs> so smooth, it looks like I shaved my legs. <laughs> So when I get undressed, it looks like I'm wearing a sweater dress. <laughs> and to make matters worse, that dress has started filling out. <laughs> I gotta think about health now that I'm getting older. You know, and I know this, you know, like, I've, I decided to try to get healthy, and I, I did pretty good, been pretty successful at losing some, some weight, you know, I quit drinking soda, I started exercising a little bit, and it's been great, but now my body's, like, in a weird transition, right, because, like, I'm not big, I'm not skinny, I have skinny arms, skinny legs, the bottom, or the body of a potato, I, <laughs> I basically just look like a live-action Mr. Potato now, <laughs> you know, like, my mouth says I died in exercise, and my body says he's a liar. <laughs> That's where I'm at. But I have to keep doing more. It's never enough, because the other day, I found out how out of shape I am. That's right. I broke wind and had to stop to catch my breath. <laughs> Yeah, it's time to try to exercise a little more. Uh, decided I was gonna work out at home. Uh, round of applause if you've ever done one crunch, and I don't mean from Taco Bell. <laughs> Few people, all right, cool, cool. Round of applause if you've done 50 crunches. Wow, Ooh, we work out in Utah, I like it, all right. Uh, I decided I was gonna do 50 crunches. And I gotta be honest, I didn't know if 50 crunches was a lot of crunches. Like, I felt like 50 was a good whole round number that I could achieve, right? So I laid down to do the 50 crunches. Three hours later, I woke up for the most amazing nap of my life. <laughs> Not necessarily getting in shape, but I'm getting well rested, so. <laughs> That's probably good for my health as well. Because yeah. as you get older, like I said, is you have to take on more responsibility. With responsibility comes stress. You know, I've definitely been through some stressful situations in my life. And I was talking to a friend about all the stress, and they suggested that I get a therapy animal. Which I thought was kind of funny, because any other time I talk to an animal, people think I'm crazy. <laughs> all right, one person got that. <laughs> I did think about it though, I thought about a therapy animal. I decided to adopt a cat. Yep, I got a cat, a rescue. And you gotta be careful when you get a rescue because you don't know what you're gonna get. You, you really don't. You don't know how that relationship's gonna go. 
Uh, in our case, my cat, I don't think he liked me at first. You know? And he was like the devil in the fact that he convinced everybody that he didn't exist. Because whenever any of my friends would come over, he was cute and adorable and cuddly. But as soon as they left, the meanest cat ever. He turned into like a cat assassin. He just bit my arms, scratched my arms. At one point, I had so many bite marks and scratches on my arms, I looked like I had a seizure during acupuncture. <laughs> yeah, it was bad, so bad. You know? And it, it definitely doesn't help the stress when you come home and you gotta like look over your shoulder. <laughs> I'm like, where is this guy? I'm a 200 pound man afraid of a 10 pound cat. <laughs> stresses through the roof. But now we have a pretty good relationship. We have a, we kind of have our thing, you know? When I go to bed at night, he jumps on the bed, circles my body like a vulture. In the middle of the night, he just, I'll wake up with him licking my forehead. We make eye contact, it's awkward, because then he's like, whoa, oh, thought you were dead. <laughs> I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> I'm a big fan of parks. I think parks are fun. Think about all the different kinds of parks there are. You've got amusement parks, water parks, trailer parks. <laughs> You're like, whoa, what, trailer parks? <laughs> Have you ever been to one? They're pretty fun, I know. <laughs> All those parks are fun parks, I know, because I've been to all those parks. <laughs> I know. I'm, I've lived in a trailer park. I know, you're probably surprised. You're like, whoa, you're wearing a sweater. Why would, how, how did you come from a trailer park? <laughs> and I just gotta say, if you don't believe me, I do have white trash roots, and I have a tattoo of a Twinkie to prove it. <laughs> yes. But I lived in a fancy trailer park. The ones that they call mobile home resorts. <laughs> right? Where they only resort to false advertising. <laughs> That's what happens there. You know, because they tell you about all the cool amenities that are on the, on the, in the resort. Like, it has a pool. But they don't tell you it's just a duck pond. <laughs> They tell you, we've got off-street parking. You move in and they give you cinder blocks to lift your car. <laughs> Say, every unit has cable TV. You just have to open up your front windows because cops is right across the street. <laughs> and I know trailer parks have a lot of uh, negative connotations to them. And I, I think mobile homes are the best invention. They really are. Because if you don't like your neighbors, you can just move. You just back a truck up and go. You don't even have to pack. That's amazing. But where I live, tornadoes are a real threat. You gotta worry about tornadoes. My friends were always concerned about me. They're always like, Dan, you live in a trailer park. What are you gonna do if a tornado comes through? Well, I try to be optimistic, and I always tell them, I think you don't know how tornadoes work, because if a tornado comes through here, every home is mobile. <laughs> That's just science. <laughs> I'm optimistic. You know what it is to me? A surprise amusement park ride. <laughs> One minute I'm having a drink in my living room, the next I'm in my neighbor's yard, but we're having fun. Because <laughs> we're in the park. I'm engaged. Sorry, ladies. Uh, I'm in a great relationship, and I know she's the one, because she's the third one. <laughs> they say three times a charm, right? <laughs> right? The first marriage actually lasted 12 years. My second marriage lasted uh, three days. Uh, so in my family, I hold the, both records for longest and shortest marriages. <laughs> Still waiting on a trophy. But we work really well together as a couple. And I think that's because we're opposite people, you know? Like, my fiance, 
She's like a tall glass of fine wine. I'm more of a short PBR. <laughs> she dresses like she's part of the yacht club. I dress like I'm definitely playing Dungeons and Dragons in my mom's basement. <laughs> she has good credit and I have a gift card for Olive Garden. <laughs> we're opposite, but we work and we're in love. Round of applause if you've ever been in love. <laughs> oh. Love is a beautiful thing, but love will get you to do some questionable things. I'm like, I definitely did some questionable things for love. Uh, but I think the most questionable thing I've ever done for love is I let a woman convince me to spend $3,000. It was $3,000, and in case we're, we didn't hear it, $3,000 on a set of pots and pans. That is an appropriate reaction. <laughs> I didn't even know you could spend $3,000 on pots and pans. They know. Yeah, they're so expensive, you have to finance these pots and pans. My friends had mortgage payments, car payments, I had pan payments. You have no idea how stressful that is for a guy my size to think if I miss a pan payment, my pants could be repossessed. <laughs> Talk about a stressful situation. Ooh. And you can't, like I said, you can't get these at a department store. You, know, you have to go to, uh, basically you have to join a secret society where you're invited <laughs> by another member. Uh, I like to refer to that member as an idiot. <laughs> because only idiots go, I know, I'm the idiot, I went. <laughs> they tell you, though, this is how they get people to go to these, though. They say, if you go to the demonstration, they're going to show you how the pans work, they're going to cook you a nice meal, and then they're going to give you a free gift. Now, that's two frees. I'm like, I'm game. I can totally go sit through, sit through this demonstration for some free things, right? And then after it's done, I'll say no. And then I'm gonna have a free meal and a free gift, and today's gonna be a good day. Now, her friend convinced her that these pots and pans were the greatest pans ever made. In fact, she convinced her that they were God's greatest gift to the world. That's how good they were. So when we went, she went in knowing she was gonna buy the pots and pans. <laughs> We didn't communicate this beforehand. We had two completely opposite plans. So we sit through the demonstration, they cook us a nice meal. I gotta say, the bands were impressive, the food was good. We got to the end of the demonstration, and then the lady giving the demonstration looked us both in the eyes, smiled, and said, now that you've seen what the pots and pans could do, would you like to buy a set? I immediately said no. She simultaneously said yes. Then I looked at her, she looked at me, we locked eyes. And at that very moment, I decided it was time to man up. Put my foot down. And then we locked eyes again. <laughs> but now her demeanor changed. Because now she had a look of anger and rage. And I'd seen that look before plenty of times, believe me. Oh, I saw it one time at a zoo. A guy said something really dumb to her, made her so mad, she punched the guy in the face, knocked him out, and put him in the hospital. So when I got out of the hospital, you bet I bought those pots and pans. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. That is my time on Dan Rubens Jr. Enjoy the rest of the show. Hey, thanks for watching my dry bar comedy special. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you're watching this far, you probably did enjoy it. And if you really enjoyed it, the best way to show how much you appreciate live comedy is by leaving a nice tip. Because you know, I have pants to pay for.